good morning, everybody. Uh, super proud of you for making it in on an early Monday morning, especially you know, holiday too, I guess. But um, anyways, we got a kind of got like a story that we want to tell you today. Super excited to be here um, with one of our best partners. But really what we want to do is talk to you about kind of the state of the industry, how things have kind of always been in the past, and then where we see things moving forward. We've got a real time example of Again, a great partner that's taken the initiative to move their business in a forward thinking manner. So um, without further ado, we'll kind of jump into it and do some intros. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cam Karangi. I am the e-commerce sales manager for Encompass Technologies. I uh, lead a team of individuals that basically educate our industry on all of our e-commerce solutions like online ordering, payment solutions, inventory insights, all kinds of cool data, data analytics that you're able to use and uh, be super productive with out in the market. Um, Thomas, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Thomas Johnstone, uh, VP of Sales Technology and Strategy at Eagle Rock Distributing. Uh, so we have operations in both Georgia and Colorado. And um, in my role, I, I manage our, our tech stack, develop our sales technology initiatives, and then uh, our sales strategy for, for both uh, states and all sales divisions. Um, a little bit about myself, not to bore you to death, and some of you that know me have heard this story a lot, but I'm, you know, I do work for Encompass, but I'm not a super techie guy. I'm from the industry, so I um, grew up in the industry with my pops. He, uh, he, had, he ran some C-stores, so I grew up in that business. <coughs> Tried to get out of it through getting my degree in finance, moved out to California, found myself back working for a large wholesaler in Alabama, multi-state wholesaler. Did that for a better part of a decade. So um, I like to consider myself one of you all. Uh, I can empathize with some of the challenges and opportunities that are out there. I've experienced a lot of what you've experienced, working my way through the ranks. And um, the reason that I'm actually here and working with Encompass is, is because they are super innovative and we have an exciting opportunity to just try to make the industry better. So um, again, not, wa not wanting to bore you to death, but just want to let you know, like. It's super relevant and super exciting for me to be up here to be able to speak with you because I've kind of seen the industry grow. So what are we gonna talk about today? Um, again, this is all about building a future-proof sales organization. So we really wanna understand why. Like, what is your why? Why do, you, why do you care about changing your organization? Why do you care about changing your go-to-market strategy? Why should you care about all of that? And uh, you know, what, what, is it, what does that even mean, right? And then what we're going to talk about is like, we'll just give you a brief overview of what we're doing now, kind of how all of you are probably operating in a general sense today. Um, again, we'll talk about what you have the opportunity to do in the future. And then I'm going to let Thomas speak for, uh, you know, majority of it because I, I really want you to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? So um, rather than me get up here and talk to you about, you know, all of the different solutions that are available, I would rather him share his experience with his organization. They've done a tremendous job, uh, you know, just changing the way that they go to market. So it's super cool. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the available plans and options that are out there that you can use to do some of the things that Thomas has done at Eagle Rock. Uh, and then we'll open it up questions, right? So we'll love to hear from you, um, see what you have to say, and hopefully we can answer some of those questions for you. So let's jump in. As we get going, like throughout this presentation, there's just a few things that you should probably just be thinking in your head and asking yourself uh, when you're thinking about your sales organization and how you want to go to market, <coughs> all these kind of things, right? Like, are you leaving money on the table? There's always an opportunity to run your business more effectively and efficient, right? So there's definitely some solutions out there that can drive efficiency from a monetary standpoint, and there are all you know, operational aspects that can make your business more efficient as well that will cut cost and, uh, you know, in turn, drop some profits. Um, sales reps. Right now, a lot of them are basically task doers, for lack of a better way of saying it. I, I hate to say that, but they're going through the motions every single day, and they're just basically doing the same thing. And we've turned them into um, almost machines that go out there and merchandise and take inventory. And we're really limiting limiting the ability for them to be sales consultants, limiting the ability for them to actually get out there and uh, be productive because a lot of their time is spent doing um, non-sales related activities. So 
think about that as we're going through this as well, because Thomas is going to do a really cool job of, of sharing some of the things that they've done with their go-to-market strategy from a sales rep standpoint to make their business more efficient. And you'll see proof in the pudding as well with some of the numbers that um, that they've been able to achieve through dropping that initiative. Uh, all of the tools that are available, right? Like so, several you know technology companies have things that are available that can make your business more efficient, especially in the e-commerce space. Again, when it comes to online ordering solutions, when it comes to payment processing solutions, when it comes to data analytics, are you are you using those solutions? Do you know what's available? Um, again, these are things that can definitely change your market. Uh, and then this is one of the most common things. We're just doing it because we've always done it that way, right? Like we've been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years. It's the way we always do it. It makes sense. It works. I don't want to change. Um, and that's one of the biggest barriers is that re that resistant resistance to change mindset that we have to overcome at the leadership level. And then it starts with us filtering it down all the way to the sales reps, right? Because if we don't believe in the vision, they're not going to believe in our vision. So, um, and then there's the cost of service, right? So there's several accounts out there based off of you know the way that you're set up from an operational logistics standpoint that you're and I, I hate to use this term but you may be over servicing because you have to right so having data analytics having certain tools allows you to reanalyze your business allows you to understand what those accounts are allows you to create a better game plan so that you can go to market and be a little bit more strategic on how you manage those accounts to try to be a little bit more profitable so again, just as you're thinking about those questions, we can think about some of the uh, opportunities that are available when it comes to you know, your sales organization. So right now, like we just discussed, there's a lot of time spent on admin tasks. They're doing inventory counting. They're, they're, you know, they're sitting around waiting on a retailer to write a check uh, or a money order or whatever it may be, right? And they're, you know, they're just in the car lot driving between accounts. So um, just a lot of stuff going on there. The, from, a, from a data standpoint, a lot of it, as you all know, is trapped between the tiers. So suppliers have a lot of information that they're not you know, necessarily um, always making available for us as wholesalers. And then just a lot of things become siloed. So when you have a more open environment, it gives you more access to being able to make better decisions when it comes to that data, right? Uh, quality of life is a big one. Again, when it comes to having to having your, your team out on the road all the time and then they're sitting around waiting on checks and then it just and then they have to come back to the shop and sit in the office and wait for the checks to be reconciled before they can go home. There's just a lot of these different things that are a little bit outdated that we can do a better job with to make them better, you know, make them a, a little bit happier, right? Which in turn should make them better employees, which in turn should make your organization run more efficiently. efficiently. And then there's obviously the issue that comes down to um, you know, payments, right? Like bad checks, again, having to go recollect if they have a bad check or if they didn't have a check. All of this stuff is super inefficient, right? So again, as we're, as we're going through this presentation, think about these things. Think about the, the operational and sales go-to-market inefficiencies that you have in your organization today. And then when Thomas starts going through what they're doing to kind of combat and mitigate some of that, I think it'll get you really excited about the future. So. As we're talking about these challenges, the goal is, is to create an environment to where you're making money, you've got a functional, effective sales team, right, that's out there accomplishing the goals that you want. So rather than them going through the minutia of counting the inventory, spending 70% of their time doing non-sales related tasks, now you can really focus on the MBOs. You can increase your expectations of them. You can really drive your, you can kind of change your operational go-to-market strategy because they will have more time to focus on that. And that's the, that's the whole concept that you have to have too is as you're making changes to your go-to-market strategy, it cannot be a situation to where you basically say, get all of your, get all of your retailers on an online ordering platform. That's it. You actually have to do a very good job of communicating what the new day in the life of a sales rep is or else they're not going to understand what the day in the life of a new sales rep is going is supposed to be. They're going to think that you're basically either cutting a position because you don't need them anymore because of online ordering or online payments, or um, they're they're going to take the path of least resistance and they're going to go play golf at one o'clock in the afternoon because they don't have, they don't have 
that same set schedule. So what you really got to do is define what those new activities are, whether it's surveys, whether it's increased MBO activity, whether it's whatever it is that makes sense from a, a go-to-market strategy to make your uh, operation run a little bit more effectively. And so with that, I'm going to stop talking and actually let Thomas jump into the whole conversation about what they did at Evil Rock. Awesome. Thanks, Cam. Yeah, so as I start going through some of these slides and, and talk through what, what led us to, to today's sales rep, um, Cam teed it up perfectly because it's not this single approach of, okay, I, I install all this technology and all of a sudden I have this fast moving adaptive sales force. It takes technology and a, and a revised improved route to market. So keep that in mind as I'm going through um, slides. But in terms of, of this transition, you can see these questions on, on the screen and, and on your, your handouts. Um, you know, we really took a step back and evaluated our entire organization. We really focused on on-premise initially, um, but asking ourselves, you know, where are we? What kind of challenges are we facing? Um, where do we want to go? How do we get there? But the ultimate question was disruption. And we knew technology is coming. Everybody knows technology is improving month over month, day over day, year over year. But it's the, the question about disruption is, are we gonna be disrupted or are we going to disrupt our organization? And that was a tough thing, a tough pill to swallow um, because we knew some people wouldn't make it through the transition because they were on it. They wanna hold on to those legacy procedures and policies and things that they've been accustomed to because we've, we've been doing it this way a long time. And change is the most difficult thing for any organization, including ours. So sat down with, with ownership, sat down with their CEO, and we really thought through, okay, if we're gonna create this, this new department, this new team, the sales tech and strategy team, what is success? So we wrote this mission statement, and it hasn't changed in five years, thankfully. Um, but our goal, our mission is to, how do we strategically align our people and technology to deliver a measurable impact on time to sell, retailer engagement, and win rates? Now that's a really complicated way to say if we put our people in front of our retailers more often and foster quality engagement, we should hear yes more often. Nothing mind blowing there. So once we apply that, that mission statement, that, that idea where we wanna to go to, to our team, we started to evaluate our team. And if you think about the account manager of in our organization, that traditional account manager or the account manager of, you know, when I started 21 years ago on a keck truck, um, he was the mailman. He was up and down the street, he hits his stops, he hits his accounts in a certain order. God forbid something happens, he gets a flat tire because his day goes to hell in a handbasket and he barely recovers, but he is set in his ways and it's a very strict, regimented process. Um, amazing relationships, but as Cam said earlier, not always, but most of the time, these reps are more relationship um, enablers, order collectors, order creators, um, and we, we know there's more out there. Um, I, I can remember sitting at an account or, or doing a ride with, with a rep when I was a, a sales manager and walking into an account, it was like their second or third week of, of being opened. Um, we walk in, there's a wine rep doing a tasting, say it's 10 o'clock, we go in the cooler, we're counting, we're reorganizing, we're helping them doing the things that we do. Walk back out 30, 45 minutes later, the rep is still there sampling and selling. And our guy's got his head buried in his iPad, not selling. So we thought, okay, there's a better way. How do we free up this time to sell um, and make it more impactful for, for our customers and for our team? So then as, as we categorize the, the general tasks that our reps are doing, you know, you can see based on this simple pie chart between meeting some admin tasks, traveling between accounts, um, selling, and then, and then the majority of their time is spent processing orders, transcribing orders, creating orders. Again, we thought there's got to be a better way. So this is just a slide that, uh, that we threw in here just to talk about basically the overall um, concept of e-commerce that, that we envision, right? There's really, I've kind of alluded to it already, but there's really three pieces to the puzzle. There's, you know, for a sales rep, there's, there's the, and for the retailer in general, just the, the ordering payment, go-to-market strategy, right? There's the ordering process, 
if a retailer can order, they should probably also be able to pay, right? And then what do you do with all this information? So now that you have this system in place, we should be able to take the insights that we get from those connections at retail and make them actionable, right? Like we should be able to do something with them from a go-to-market strategy. So those are the three pieces that you hear, see here. You have online ordering, which is just the ability for a retailer to place an order online or browse your portfolio or do a number of other things, right? And you have contactless payments. This is just an efficiency mechanism. Like way too many checks being captured right now. We're still in this, this age of like, you know, three decades in the past where we probably shouldn't even be worried about that kind of stuff, but here we are. So really trying to move forward to a contactless payment method. And then, um, you know, it creates so many efficiencies, honestly. We, we'll get into a little bit later, but um, really big on this. And then, and then retail insights and data, right? That's again, that's having a connection with the point of sale system at the retailer that's integrated with your software that allows you to pull in real time inventory values because you know, theoretically, if we know it's being sold into the account by the rep or through an online ordering platform, right? And we know it's being sold through the account at the consumer purchase, you know, at the checkout, then we can back our way into real-time analytics and we can provide that for reps, we can provide that for sales reps. This is all stuff that's available today, stuff that you may not know is available today, but we really need to be, um, you know, understanding it and, and wanting to use it a little bit more. So once we, developed our strategy, found, discovered the solutions that make sense for our organization and implemented them, you can see where we are today on the right. Um, taking the amount of time we're selling from 30% to you know close to 70%, we have some reps when we did this time to sell study are in the 70s and 80s because they really pushed the envelope on, on implementation and, and how we're executing these programs with retailers. Um, as Cam alluded to earlier, it's not a singular strategy of, hey, we turn on online ordering, we turn on contactless payments, we turn on these things and everything's fantastic. Um, once you reclaim that time to sell, if you don't specifically define your expectations from when do you start, when you stop, what are the tasks that I expect you to execute, they're gonna make it up on their own. Um, you know, we were very deliberate in, in our messaging to our team. Um, the, uh, the conspiracy theories that, that were out there when we first got, got into this game, you know, you're gonna replace me with an app uh, from the rep side. From the retailer side, you're gonna take away my rep and I'm never gonna see him anymore because uh, they've, they've experienced that with some other organizations um, and nothing could be further from the truth and we explained over and over again, look, we, we, want, we want to foster better engagement. We want to foster um, bigger impact, more consultative activities, not just I come in, I collect the order, and I get to spend five minutes with you telling you what it is, and then I ask for a tap or I ask for a package placement, and then I'm off to run to my next stop. So, so once we got past that, got everybody comfortable, we started looking at, at additional data points that aren't simply, when do I have to be at the account to collect the order? Um, things like account segmentation, what are the opportunities or influenceability of the account? Um, now that my rep has all this time, can I take them from, I wanna say our, our, our previous account, so our stop count per rep was around 125, 130. We're approaching 190 to 200 at this point because we're not trapped by collecting orders. So that took us from, again, the mailman to where we were not too long ago. Um, the rep has, has progressed much more digital know-how um, very, very uh, much more adaptive, um, but still, you know, stops by, slightly consultative, but there's, we knew there was still some room for improvement. Once we clearly defined what that improvement was and how we can, how we can turn the dial just a little bit more, we started seeing some amazing numbers. And here are Georgia on-premise revenue trends year to date. And if you start all the way to left, you can see kind of the, the sum of the department. Um, up 6% in revenue, nothing to shake a stick at. Um, and you look at those accounts because we're, we're currently roughly 93% of our retailers are on their preferred online ordering platform. Um, so 7% not on a platform. You can see what that 7% of accounts, the way their trends are, are reflecting. Um, all the way to the right, well, I, I won't skip over EDI, it's kind of made its reemergence. I'm sure you've seen it in some of your markets. Um, 
for those those retailers placing their own order. It could be through a, you know a, a system or an algorithm or whatever, mainly in the chain world. Um, but again, our rep isn't focused on order collection, so he has the ability to sell. Still room for improvement, which is where DSD Link comes in. And you can see DSD Link, 30, almost 30% 30 growth year over year. And that's because not only have we removed the, the confines of having to collect the order, but the retailer's shopping and they're discovering products on their own. Uh, DSD Link's become that silent salesman that um, is allowing retailers to shop on their own time, again, discover new products, um, learn about those products that maybe they already carry. Uh, but when you, when you look at traditional versus DSD Link, I mean, we're talking about a 50% lift. And it's, again, completely changed the way that, that, that our, our on-premise department runs. Um, here is a quarter by quarter look at, at our digital transformation in Georgia. Um, we really decided to take the plunge Q4 of 2018, and, and you can see the, the percentage on the right is the percentage of revenue that's been converted digitally. So what's going through our platforms? What are our reps not keying into Encompass Mobile? And for the first, I'll call it a year, um, we did an okay job. I'll grade myself an okay job. Um, we started off converting ProCell, then converted on-premise chains, and that's when we hit our lull, and that's when the conspiracy, conspiracy theories ran, ran wild, because our independents were like, no, I like things the way they are. I don't want to change. Once we started getting a couple of big wins, we got some momentum, um, and that'll take us to Q1 of 2020, and as you guys well know, um, the pandemic hit. And our on-premise world, our entire world was turned upside down. Um, and we really took a step back and said, okay, this tool can help our team stay safe, can help, our, can help our retailers stay safe. Let's get everybody on the platform. So once retailers got on the platform, they started shopping, engagement went through the roof. Uh, and I wanna say April or May of that year, we made the decision as an organization to mandate it. We said, this is working. If it's working during the pandemic, why can't it work during normal times? And we never looked back. We, we set a, uh, a, a date of July 6th or July 2nd, something like that, and we wanted everybody on. And, and you can see, there's my handy dandy laser pointer they gave me. Um, you know, you can see here's the kind of the deadline. We said we want everybody on. We hit 80% DNR. Um, our, our more urban area, um, city center, if you will, uh, is hovers around 80 to 85%. Our market that's more rural up in North Georgia, which I thought would be the opposite, hovers around 90, 95% DNR. Like those, the reps up there key nothing in except new placements. Um, and it's freed up so much time. And, and these, this team is, is, or that particular team, excuse me, um, are delivering some of, the, some of the best results. When we look at, at What's the, what's the most telling measure of how time to sell can really impact your organization? These are placements. So if we take all package, draft, wine, spirits, in a wrap it all up into placements, you can see how the team kind of progressed quarter over quarter, laying that on top of the DNR trend line prior to installing online ordering, just shy of 13,000 pods. The pandemic hit. And granted, you know, are we always growing? Of course, we're a sales organization. Placements are always happening. We're growing, we're getting new pods, portfolios resizing constantly. But once we got to that point where we had all this time, it was lights out. Um, so to look at where we were in 2018, you know, 12,766 pods to where we were um, at our high point last year, Q3, so three years later, to grow almost 6,000 pods is nothing to shake a stick at. So that takes us to our rep of today. They have all this time. We're helping them refine how they're using it. We're giving them new tools and ways to use it. Analytics, data, improved selling techniques, improved sell sheets. Um, they don't stop by anymore. They have purpose-driven appointments with their retailers. They're, they're, they're setting up um, 
as they're setting up retailer uh, appointments, they're talking about what's on your agenda, Mr. Retailer. How can I consult you on ways to improve your business? It's just, it's just not what's on my PFP anymore, my MBOs, or what new product did I launch, but how can I have a real impact on your business? And the only way we've been able to do that is through Encompasses Solutions. So these days when we have reviews with our reps, these are the type of questions that we're asking. It's not, did you hit all your stops? Um, you know, how are you doing on this or that? It's, you know, how, how is your time to sell really impacting your, your retailers? Um, what can we do to improve your sales planning, your sales calls? How much time are you spending with your buyers? Um, where are your KPIs? How's your execution? And ultimately the, the number one co question for our reps is am I making more money? Um, and, and they all are. So I think Cam's gonna run through some tools that got us there. Yeah, I'm gonna, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna speak a little bit about the options that are available for, uh, for you all to start making these impactful changes in your market as well. So we talked about the three core solutions that kind of drive this future proof proofing of a sales organization. First being online ordering, right? And like, I think everybody, for the most part, started hearing about online ordering solutions a couple of years ago, right around the pandemic. Um, huge catalyst for that piece of the business. But the way we like to think about it now, instead of it just being an opportunity for, um, for your retailers to order or for your sales reps to save a little bit of time, we wanna add another layer in there and basically say like your online ordering platform should be your e-commerce hub for your retailer, for your reps. And what I mean by that is it should be, it should be multifaceted. So you should, your retailer should have the ability to not only place their order, not only browse different products and solutions, not only have access to operational information like their delivery date or anything like that, right? Um, so they're not having to call the sales reps to get that information, but they should probably also have the ability to um, to pay their bills as well, right? If they're not if they're not already set up on some type of uh, ACH, if they're not a part of that one of those chain agreements with FinTech or iControl like that, there's been solutions for independent accounts too. So this is not something that you have to think of in a limited capacity anymore. You can get every single account, and one of, I don't want to speak for Eagle Rock, but one of their initiatives is to actually go completely contactless and have you know their retailers, not just in the on-premise world, but off-premise as well, right? Um, using an, uh, an online payment system, which just reduces so much of the time and effort that it uh, takes to, to kind of um, collect those payments. So as we're thinking about this, we will start with the online ordering process, but just remember, it's more of just a hub of an environment for uh, you internally, but also for your retailers to just have a much more efficient um, conversation. So I'm going to show you kind of the before and after here. This is kind of, again, Thomas did a good job talking specifically about Eagle Rock. It's more generalized, but this is what we're, this is kind of how we operate today from a pre-sale standpoint, right? Um, and it's not bad, like it's great, but, but things always can be a little bit better and there's always more opportunities, right? So here's kind of some of the challenges, right? You're, you're your teams are rushing through their day. They're just kind of trying to get stuff done so they get all their orders in. So somebody's not complaining at them. So they're not missing cutoff times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, unfortunately, with that mentality, it limits their ability to be productive. So uh, what do we want to do? We actually want to save them some time. Um, and this is these are, these are actually stats that were produced by MBWA. So definitely appreciate these there. So we kind of stole them, gave them the credit at the bottom. But um, but this is the difference that you'll see from a timing standpoint when it comes to pre-sell versus online order and calls to sell, right? I'll let y'all look at that for just a second. You've got your handouts as well, um, so you can certainly review that later. But this is this is pretty impactful information. And I've got another breakdown here as well. So you're gonna have five times more to sell on average, and it's gonna cost you less as well, right? That's, that's pretty awesome. So basically what we've done here is through an online ordering platform, we've mitigated some of these challenges that we, you know, that we had in pre-sale before. Because we're now we're able to make our sales teams more efficient, right? Now we're able to give our retailers access to our portfolios so that they can make decisions themselves. And you know, Thomas called it out earlier. Like one of the biggest fears is that. Um, well, I guess there's two fears. There's the internal fear that your sales team is gonna. Uh, 
gonna start to come some type of internal militia against you. Um, and then there's also the uh, the fear that the retailers just not gonna be able to handle it, right? Like they're not gonna make the right orders, they're not gonna do what they need to do to keep their own business running. But that might be a little bit arrogant for us to think, hopefully they care about their business. And actually what we found is that, Thomas kind of iterated earlier, they will spend more time in these applications looking at your portfolio versus having a sales rep walk into an account, hey, Mr. and Ms. Retailer, walk to the back, do the merchandising, come out, have a two minute conversation about some new products that you just started carrying. They certainly can't talk about the thousand SKUs that you're getting like every couple months, right? But when you have an online ordering platform that has some pretty cool algorithms that can suggest items, you can market, you can do other things like that, what happens is, is they will spend time in there shopping. I mean, they care about their business too. And it's just like Amazon. So if you give them that Amazon environment, how many of you have Amazon packages at your door probably right now waiting on you to get home? Yeah, a, a quick story. So we, we purchased operations in Colorado a couple of years ago. Um, we're installing the same agenda we did in Georgia, installed this tech stack in Colorado. I'm riding with one of our reps down in Pueblo. Onboard a new account to pro, uh, excuse me to DSD Link, um, and as we're onboarding her, she, she says, "I need my customers are asking for Arizona tea. All right, but we don't sell Arizona." Um, okay, teach her how to key in her order, sign her up for for PayLink, um, and then we leave. And the salesman Terry goes, "She already screwed it up." I said, "Well, why?" Well, she ordered Tavana. <coughs> Terry, she just asked for a T. You found our T on DSD link, so that's that's a good thing. And you just saw like that deer in the headlights moment of okay, like this this is the silent salesman that they're talking about. This is this is how it's going to get me more placements when when I'm up there. Uh, but it was it was impactful. Yeah, thank you. That's a great story, um, and that kind of reminds me of a. I'll tell another story. Um, this was when we were starting to launch a couple of years ago. I was actually in the market with Mississippi, a couple of guys from Mississippi, and we were onboarding a few retailers, and I was just doing a market visit with them. Um, and again, you're thinking technology, it's gonna scare some retailers, right? And, and, it, does, and it may initially. Um, it's definitely gotta be explained and sold the right way, but that's what we're here to do. Um, in Mississippi, rural Mississippi, walk into an American Legion post, which I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with those, right? Just a nice older lady um, behind the counter, immediately like, I don't want to, don't want to, don't want to talk really, just don't have anything to do with it. Great sales rep, kind of, we talked to her a little bit, just like, let me just, let's get you just signed up so you can look at it, whatever, right? So she finally agrees to just register. She's like, I'm adamantly not going to use the tool, right? Just doesn't want to. As soon as she gets signed up, like the first thing she sees is the wholesaler that I was with, Portfolio, and she just sees this little section that says new products. And it just clicked in her head. She's like, you mean that I don't have to call you to look at new products anymore? I can just open this app and look at all the new items. She's like, done. It was like that, just like a light switch. So there's always that pain point. There's always that something that, you know, it's going to make somebody's life easier. And that's what these solutions do. So it's pretty cool. And, and again, just throwing some stats up here so you can kind of get your eyes on some of the results that we've seen over time. Um, some of the benefits to online ordering platforms like we talked about, so I'll just kind of highlight it again, is just things that you don't think of. You're immediately thinking of the functionality of allowing the retailer to place the order. What gets lost is the access to your system. So now a retailer has basically an area to they, where they can go in and look at what they need to look at whenever they want. For sales reps information in there, again, their delivery information, anything that you want to market specifically towards them is available. So it's just a good communication tool. It's more than just a platform for them to place orders online. Um, and then, you know, Thomas, I'll probably lean on you here a little bit just for more stories about what you guys are doing at Evil Rock, but, you know, we, we talked about it. If you give somebody a, the ability to place an order, like it would be crazy to go on Amazon and place an order and then have to send a check in. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't do that. You go ahead and link everything up and you pay however you're going to pay. Um, 
that's what these integrated payment solutions do. Now, we, of course, respect all the state legalities. So if you're a state that can offer uh, your retailers card payments, then, you know, just, you know, set up a direct ACH. If you can't allow card payments, that's a thing. Remote capturing is a thing, right? These are all things that save your drivers time from not having to wait around and collect checks and not having to wait around on that reconciliation process at the end of the day. I mean, imagine your drivers just being able to finish their day and go home and not have to sit in a room and wait for somebody to basically count their checks, scan them through, right? Um, this is what you're looking for if you want an integrated payment solution. You want to make sure it checks all these box boxes, right? It needs to be integrated into your system. That way everything flows naturally, right? You don't, you don't necessarily need to have different places for it to fall apart, if you will. So online ordering complemented by a payment solution makes sense, right? And then um, one of probably the coolest thing that we've discovered you know, over the last nine months or so that we've been really excited to launch out in the market is Retail Insights. It's uh, basically data management at, retail, at the retail level. So having the ability to um, integrate directly into the point of sale systems with retailers, right? And then doing that allows you to basically track by SKU what's going on with an account, you know, at the exact time that it's happening. All that information gets rolled back up into a dashboard for your teams, your leadership teams and your sales management teams, or I'm sorry, your sales reps, to be able to make decisions, right? And, and those decisions could be anything along the lines of being notified to when inventory is running low on a certain item within a certain account. It also could be just understanding different trends over time so that you can make different decisions. It could be understanding what products are not doing well in account, which we call stagnant SKUs, so that you can maybe replace those items with items that are selling. Um, it allows for opportunities like pre-built suggested orders, right? Because we know order flows, we know what's in the account, we can create bill twos and par values and all that kind of stuff. That way when the rep walks into the account, everything's already basically set up for them. And then at Thomas's point, they're, they're immediately a sales rep. Like their head doesn't even have to go to the the the, uh, the minutia of the like the day-to-day -day task of counting inventory or anything like that it's it's a quick spot check it's a quick you know let's make sure everything looks right type deal and then let's get to actually making something happen in this account so super cool initiative um, Thomas if you don't mind I'd love to kind of hear like you just kind of talk a little bit more about what you guys are doing with retail insights and how it impacts you guys sure yeah so we we started out with retail insights uh, focusing on on the independent side so we, we, we took a step back, ran some reports, and looked at what, what accounts are taking the longest to, to service and create an order for. Um, kind of a tale of, of two markets, Colorado, very heavy package of liquor, and we have some, we have some accounts, some mega, some mega package of liquor stores that are uh, like four hour inventory jobs, hour uh, order creation uh, jobs. So we were able to install Retail Insights after meeting with the retailer, telling them how secure the information was, what we were gonna do with it, what our real intentions were, so clear expectations on what they can get from us. And then we're able to distill down that inventory taking process from four hours to about 45 minutes of spot checking. We're able to distill down that um, order generation process from an, an hour to about 15 minutes. So taking call it a four to five hour job down to an hour, and then redeploy that sales rep to, to focus on merchandising tasks, um, display building, um, just all the execution elements that we, we do, but if we're doing them at a seven, now we're doing them at a 10. Um, from there, in our Georgia market, much more chain heavy, chain driven. Um, and I don't wanna steal the thunder, but if you wanna, yeah. Um, so, so as I'm working with the Encompass team and, and, and working through ways to, to pilot the solution, improve the solution, we discovered that there was a wealth of information like at our fingertips already. So Walmart, Retail Link, Target Vendor Portal, live inventory sitting in these portals right now. If you have access to these portals at your organization, it's there already. So connecting your live inventory on a store-by-store -store basis to, to um, Retail Insights and Encompass is gonna allow your chain team to do the same thing I just described at a packaged liquor store. Um, 
our Georgia team has, has been able to take Walmart and Target store visits down from um, you know, the 45 minutes to a 60 minute service, the, the inventory taken order generation down to about 15 minutes and, and our stores have never looked better. Um, those percentages, are those national or is that just us? Okay, good. Yep. So yeah, so you can see again, having um, just a more efficient go-to-market strategy I mean, these are undeniable numbers. Um, it's, it's another thing that's not in this presentation. It may have been a bullet point that we overlooked, but um, one thing that we've also noticed, just giving your retailers more access to tools like this, is that that basket ring is going to increase as well. So Thomas showed you the pods, but um, we've seen a natural like 17% increase in just basket ring. When I say basket ring, I mean just the actual order total of what they're ordering from you. They're browsing new products. They're looking at new things. Maybe they're able to prepare themselves a little bit better for holiday situations because they've got access to it and they're not super dependent on an individual coming into the account making the decision for them. So again, proofs in the pudding. It's, uh, it's just super cool. And, and then you see Walmart and Target here, but one of the most important initiatives we're working with right now, so many national chains are getting involved and interested in this. It's going to be exciting to see where this thing goes in the next three months, six months. So, um, and Thomas kind of alluded to this too, so we'll kind of go through it quickly and then open it up for questions because I know we're getting close to the hour here. But basically, in the past, you know, 60, 70% of the time was spent on just merchandising style task oriented activities that were not super conducive of a, you know, valuable selling environment. Now, what we've done is basically created the actual legit sales call, right? because we have all this information at our fingertips, we can create a plan before we go into the account. With Retail Insights, we have, uh, again, we know it's in the account at all times. Um, we've got suggested order opportunities that could kind of go ahead and get us ready for what should go into the account with a little bit of you know, human interaction and analysis just to make sure that, uh, that you know, you're taking into consideration certain things. But really and truly, it's it's the ability to basically optimize that sales call so that you're not so that your team's not stuck in that back room or stuck on their hands and knees, just kind of like, you know, taking care of the day to day stuff. They're actually having those conversations. They're making stuff happen. They're being a lot more strategic about their selling activities. Um, just a little bit more about retail insights, but we've kind of already talked about what it actually is. Uh, but here on the screen, you can kind of see a little bit of an example on your handouts. You might be able to see it better of what it could look like for a sales rep from a mobile standpoint and then again from a from a leadership standpoint the dashboard with the different terminologies and different reports that you have visibility to but again having having all of the different like types of categories for products like stagnant stew, stagnant skew low inventory things like that um, just makes it super valuable to be able to analyze and break down and make good strategic decisions so uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Thomas just one last time so that he can kind of share how they actually rolled this whole thing out at Eagle Rock. Thanks. Yeah, just, just like any other, any other major change, because this will be a major change if you decide to implement this in your organization, um, the same way that you roll out changes applies to technology. Like clearly communicating your expectations, defining your why to your organization, um, and, and, and lucky for me, it wasn't you know my agenda. I'm pushing this game straight from the top down, and I strongly encourage um, if there's if there's someone that's not a principal, that's not an owner, that's not an EAM, whatever whatever the top position is in your company, if they're not on board, get them on board before you launch. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle because it has to come from the top down. Um, educating your team on expectations on how things uh, function. Um, launching obviously and then uh, making sure this isn't a flash in the pan, making sure that it's not about, um, you know, this isn't the hot new toy that's at your organization that your team is in the back of their mind of thinking, oh, this, this is going to go away in six months anyway. Just deal with it um, because it, it definitely didn't happen like that at our organization. Um, and in terms of strategy, again, I, I touched on some of these points already. Um, but just, again, overall, make sure you're serious about implementing these tools because they will fundamentally change the way you go to, to market. Um, but just make sure you're ready. And the last thing we got is just this, uh, this pretty cool graphic. Throw this graphic up here just to show you how our world is actually interconnected and how these solutions that we've talked about today help everything flow more efficiently together. So 
Um, hopefully this makes sense to you. It's really cool. It's been a really fun ride for the last couple of years. And like I said, growing up in the industry my whole life, so exciting to see technology that's making our world better, um, especially in the beer industry, right? Um, we lag a little bit sometimes when it comes to technology, but now I feel like we're on the we're on the cutting edge of some of this stuff. It's pretty cool. So, with that being said, we're we're done with our presentation. We'd love to answer any questions that you might have. They're going to be easy on us. Yes, sir. Um, not being an Encompass, having Encompass as a RAS. What you mentioned, DSD Link, is can be used with other RAS, and or how does that work? If you yeah. So DSD Link can be integrated into any RAS solution. There are also other online ordering platforms that are, you know, out there great as well. You've got the Pro Vs of the world. Um, there's definitely some solutions out there that are that are functional. But yes, DSD Link does integrate with any RAS, so it's not specific to Encompass necessarily. Yeah, and it's really all sent via EDI. So as long as your system can receive EDI files, you should be able to integrate. Yes, sir. Hey, Joe. <clears throat> as, as you were migrating customers over to this platform, is there any learnings in terms of certain segments of the market that just as hard as you try, just they just do not want to order online? Did you run into that or you made it mandatory so it's, it's uh, you know, did you notice any resistance among a certain class of trade or a certain, you know, uh, market segment? Um, yeah, so, so like I said, we started with converting ProCell because that allowed us to, to redeploy that ProCell position to it's become customer success. So that position that was ProCell is now onboarding new retailers, ensuring that um, these solutions are, are made available at the start of our relationship. Um, so again, we, we started with ProCell, went to some chains. Um, if there was one common denominator between the difficult retailers, it was they were just big and they knew how big they were. So they were flexing their muscle and, okay, if you make me do this, I'm gonna kick you out. If you make me do this, I'm gonna take away your taps or I'm gonna take away your wine placements or whatever whatever the, the threat happens to be. So um, it was more about the large retailers that push back or the ones that were more technically challenged, if you will. Um, you know, Cam's story about the VFWs, it, that, that group, VFWs, um, American Legions, um, you know, we have tremendous respect for the military and, and we didn't push that segment as much as, as uh, we did others, um, but they were probably the most hesitant to adapt, uh, if I had to pick one. How important was the competitive response in the marketplace without getting into your details? I mean, I'm assuming some of the customers who would have been like, oh, I want to rep, I want to rep, the competition would automatically think, well, I'm going to over-service, I'm going to keep the rep in. And did you encounter a lot of that or did it work itself out fairly quickly? Uh, so I'll, tell, I'll, I'll share two stories. Georgia, um, luckily, Encompass does an amazing job and has incredible market share in Georgia. So our largest, our other two large competitors are also on Encompass. They also offer these solutions. Um, we touched base to make sure they knew what we were doing, asked what they were doing, um, and I'm not gonna say we, we, we went after it at the same time, but, but made sure that, hey, if, if we're gonna do this, let's do it together. So kind of that coalition, building your coalition worked well in Georgia. Same thing applied when we launched Colorado. Um, we actually worked with um, the Provi team to develop this, this Go Colorado agenda where we had other wholesalers that had similar online ordering ambitions and said, hey, again, if we're going to do this, let's do it together. And we were sharing wins, um, who was being difficult. Um, and it was, it was strange. You know, you don't, you don't call your Miller Coors guy if you're an AV guy to ask like, hey, how'd your day go selling in online ordering? Um, but we did and it, it paid dividends. But about how long did it take? Um... <clears throat> on like kind of breaking through that glass ceiling. Like you, you, you want to push online ordering, you, you talk to your sales team about it, you talk to retailers about it, and there's probably this period of continued skepticism from those two groups for a certain period of time. Thinking, hey, you're gonna take away my rep or something along those lines. Was there kind of a threshold or a window where after you know a couple of months at it and you guys sticking to the agenda you laid out where those groups said, hey, I, I see what they're doing here, 
what they told me was their goal at, you know, from the beginning continues mm -hmm. to be the goal. And you started to um, not face some of those same skepticisms or concerns that maybe you did, you know, the first time you announced it to either your internal team or to retailers. Sure, sure. We, um, we made our intentions well known. So we drafted letters in both states and letters came from, from owners and presidents uh, with what we're doing, why we're doing it. Just again, clear communication. Put that, that letter in our reps' hands. And not that we went in and, you know, it's not the, hey, this is our letter, here's what's gonna happen kind of thing. Um, it's more of that back pocket letter. So hopefully, um, just like everything else in our business, selling something is about delivery. And the way you deliver the message makes all the difference in the world. So if a rep can go in and I can sell Cam from Cam's Bar and Grill and the benefits of online ordering contactless payments, and he says yes, the letter never sees the light of the day. Um, but if I go to Jake's Bar and Grill and Jake's ready to cuss me out and tell me that he's taking away my taps, um, you know, maybe that's got to come out. Maybe that's got to be reinforced with with some with some uh, supporting documentation. Past that, um, you know, our our leadership, our ownership is is um, in the streets, in the office every day. So we we install kind of this escalation model of if I'm the rep and I talk to a retailer and and the retailer pushes back, the next step is my territory manager goes with me the next visit. Um, from there, if that doesn't work, the sales director is there at the next visit. If that doesn't work, GM is there. Then the owner is there. And there were some retailers, we had six meetings about their conversion to online ordering. And usually by the time you get to the fifth or sixth meeting, they're like, oh shit, this guy's serious. Like, I'm not getting out of this one. <laughs> Hello, okay. <laughs> Sorry if you've mentioned this already. Are you guys also on Vs, or are those not, like, are they mutually exclusive, or? Uh, so we're of the opinion that choice uh, makes all the difference in the world. Um, you know, we started with um, Pro-V and DSD Link in Georgia. We don't offer Vs currently. Uh, we have all three options in Colorado. Um, but like I said, in Georgia, there are, our largest competitors are also Encompass wholesalers. So while DSD Link is not a marketplace like Provi necessarily, it basically functions as a marketplace in Georgia. Same thing applies to Colorado, plus you have Provi that is a marketplace. Um, so again, we, we don't want to dictate what that, what that required um, portal is, but if one thing makes sense for them and something makes, uh, makes sense for somebody else, fine. At the end of the day, if, if the platforms are three-tier compliant, they offer our portfolio, they function properly, and ultimately our rep gets freed from the non-selling minutia that Cam started with. I'm a happy guy. In our company, we have uh, changed platforms two times. However, we're on the fifth platform now of change due to venture capitalists coming in by these computer technology companies. So in my career, I've sat through so many of these presentations and listened to all these commitments and watched the wholesale beverage industry invest millions of dollars in technology only today to have this room filled with people looking for better solutions. So I just hope that your commitment to the group here and your technology is long term and people transition into this new technology, you're there for the long haul with continued commitment because that hasn't been our experience in the past. Sure, and I appreciate that comment. And I think one thing that we do pride ourselves at, at Encompass is that we, uh, you know, we're, we're a distributor-based solution primarily. We're your partners primarily, and everything we do primarily is to make your lives more efficient. Um, we're super, super aggressive when it comes to our approach to like enhancing technology. So what we believe and what I firmly believe is that we want to grow with your organization. So as you grow, we want to have the capability and the technology that's available to you so that you're not having the limitations um, to not be able to do certain things. So I think the commitment's there. It's not going anywhere. Uh, 
Um, we're, 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 we're 100 percent sold on the direction we're moving with these products, uh, and because we are in Compass, we have the full suite of solutions. This is just one more thing that we're doing to make this world a better place in our in our world, at least, right? So, um, no worries there. Definitely appreciate the sentiment, understand the sentiment, but um, we are certainly aggressively moving forward and fully committed to making this work for everybody. Hi there. Um, do you guys track time to sell through Encompass? How's that analysis work? Yeah, so Encompass has um, time clock activities, I think it's what it's called. Um, so it's always running, always running. If someone logs into Encompass Mobile, they go into order entry, that's time stamped. If they go into AR, that's time stamped. All the different functions of a rep are time stamped. So it's not the, the old school, and I, I don't know who I'm talking to. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> The, the old school, you know, we're going to do a time to sell study twice a year or whatever is required per your equity agreement um, kind of went out the window because the time to sell is always on. So we can, at any point in time, we can pull a time to sell study for a rep, uh, for a department, for a team, whatever. It's also a good cross check. Um, you know, back to the conspiracy theories about, you know, you're going to replace me as a rep. Um, you know, I, f I fired two people once we launched online ordering, but it wasn't because of we had all these new efficiencies and wanted to save money. Um, it's because looking at their time clock activities, I'm like, man, there's this glaring gap after lunch. What is this guy doing? So surprise visit, and he's sleeping in a parking lot, um, taking, a, taking a cool van nap. Um, so not taking advantage of his time to sell. Um, and then another rep just, just couldn't handle um, selling. They just couldn't adapt. But both those positions were replaced, and um, that time to sell analysis kind of pointed us in the right direction. Yes, sir. Hey, you mentioned that um, your sales reps don't go by, they have purpose driven appointments. So my question is, how do, how do you guys handle the tactical tasks like product rotation, merchandising, uh, POS placement? Um, how, do you, how does your organization handle that? Yeah, so they're, they're still required to do all the, the, the X's and O's, the blocking and tackling, if you will, from, um, that we define in our structured selling process. Um, I was talking more, referencing more of like the, the true con consultation, the one-on-one, -on -one when they're meeting with the retailer. Um, CAMS slide or, or the, the MBWA data about you know how many times the rep is stopping by a store and, and you know how they could save time. Um, you know, as an example, if the traditional rep that I showed, if they're spending five minutes with a retailer once a week, a month, we're talking 20 minutes. Um, if we can go to that retailer and say, hey, can you can you give me 30 minutes once a month? where we have some true one-on-one -on -one time or an hour one-on-one -on -one time. I want to knock out, you know, what, what's in my head or what, what, what you want to work on for the next quarter. Let's knock that out. I'm still coming by every week to do rotation, make sure my neons are there, back bars face, just all the tactical stuff that, that you're, I think you're referencing. Um, but it's just a, just a way to reimagine when and how we do things. I do appreciate all of you joining us this morning. Um, I'm around for the next couple of days. Thomas will be here. Come find us, talk to us. Super excited to get to know all of you. And thanks again.